Hi, I'm Jonathan Fields, and this is Good Life Project. So my guest today is Mitch Joel. Mitch is the president of a digital marketing firm named Twist Image. He is a, a big author, podcaster, and, and a creator of a whole bunch of just amazing things. And the author of a new book called Control Alt Delete, which is kind of fascinating interplay between life and business. So we're going to jam on a lot of those different ideas. Awesome to be hanging out with you today. Hey, my pleasure. Great to be here. So. Um, I want to talk about your book because there's a lot of really fascinating stuff in it that relates, you know, it's, it's ostensibly about business, but it's really about life and the evolution of where we're all going and how we relate to each other. But, um, but I'm curious also, I'm, I, you know, I can't let you go without exploring you as a person a little bit too. <laughs> we're going to dive deep. We're going to dive deep. <laughs> okay. Nobody leaves without exactly. crying. <laughs> I swore I wouldn't cry if I came on your show, I swore. <laughs> it's okay, well, we have little eyedroppers exactly. we can put it on. Um, so you, right now, you're, you know, like you're you're a, you're a family man. You're you're you've got a really well-known agency of about a hundred plus people. Um, you're building something extraordinary. Take me back a little bit with your path because you've led a. It hasn't been a straight line. <laughs> no, no. I've got a chapter in the new book called Squiggly. Yeah. And um, it was one of those things when I realized that. Like careers are things you can only look at in reverse. It's really hard to look at them yeah. forward. And so I was, um, you ever see the movie Almost Famous? Yeah, of course. That was me. Like I was, it was me too. I often say that the song Tiny Dancer by Elton John became, I became a fan of it because of that movie. I was 18. Yeah, and that scene, by the way, is one of my like, yeah, all time favorite too. scenes ever in any movie. We have a lot more in common there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I was 18 and I would look at rock magazines. This is before the internet existed. And I, I would look at like covers of magazines and be like, wow, there's Gene Simmons of Kiss, or there's John Bon Jovi, or Metallica, or U2. And I'd be like, who are these people who get to interview them? Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> like, it's such a random, strange thing. But that was really, my, my, my question was like, who are these people who get to have these amazing conversations with these really interesting people? Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to be a music journalist. And I stumbled into this guy in a record store who was writing for this national teen magazine and computers were sort of, word processing was big then. Yeah. And he didn't really know how to type. And he had this huh. job as a journalist and he wasn't a fraud, it's just he didn't know how to really type or do anything with the computer. He was doing like typewriter stuff and whatever. Right. And I said to him, you know, just tell me what this, what it is, like read it to me and I will type it up for you and you can have it. I was just sort of like helping him out. Yeah. And at the time, there, I think CDs were just coming in. So it was really like cassettes right. and albums and yeah. stuff. And so he, we do this like weird barter of like, I'll take you to concerts and I'll give you tapes and albums and things like that. And uh, it was like, I'd done, done this for a while. And then it became this sort of like, hey, let me take, well, let's go to the show in Toronto. So we were, I live in Montreal, so we did the yeah. six hour car ride to Toronto and um, gets a call, early days of mobile phones in cars. Mm -hmm. And he's like- uh, Open up the little box. To it was totally that, like with <laughs> the wire. Really? It was like, yeah, exactly that. And I was always like, why does this guy have this? He's not a doctor. You know, it was yeah. in my brain. I'm like, is he like a drug dealer? Uh, he wasn't. And um, Motley Crue was in town and Tommy Lee was there, so it was probably 1989, and they were just about to launch this massive album that was called Dr. Feelgood. Yeah, of course. And he looked at me and said, you'll do the interview. And How old were like, you with this song? It's like 18. Oh my God. Yeah, like, oh, it's like, you forget it, it's crazy. And I love Motley Crue. Huh? And so I remember walking into the radio station and there he was, we sat down, we did this interview, and it was really cool. A couple weeks, Pro progress and I, I'm in the office of this, this magazine, which is like in the basement of this guy's home. And uh, I, he, the editor calls me in and says, did you write this article? And I was like, because <laughs> he'd been taking all my stuff and just you know, making it under his name. Right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was me. He's like, why don't we have a kid who's in his teens writing for a teen national full glossy magazine? Right. And from there, I just ran with it. But what happened was a couple years, not even a couple years later, this guy had like this massive heart problem, like a massive medical problem, young guy. And when he made it through, and thankfully he did, he was like, I want out. Like, I'm gonna go like, start a farm mm -hmm. and like grow some organic carrots or something. Uh -huh. And I was like, this can't be, I, my career. I decided to start a magazine mm -hmm. at that moment. And I, I remember going to the magazine stores and looking at editors and publishers and taking down their phone numbers. Email didn't exist. I would call them and I'd be like, hey, I'm thinking about starting magazines. Like, click. One guy, one dude after like 50 magazines who, who was the publisher or editor of like a country cottage magazine spent like two and a half hours on the phone with me walking me through no what it takes to make a magazine. I still have the black notebook with all my notes. Wow. And um, 
I just realized that's what I wanted to do. So I went out and I sort of hustled and used, leveraged some of my, my record industry friends and got advertising. So it was a free magazine that was ad supported. So the magazine was as big as how many ads I had. If I had 12 ads, I'd have 24 pages of magazine. And, and you're doing this basically on the no basis money. of a two and a half hour conversation. Yeah. You're just pulling whatever you have from and just winging a prayer hoping that this is gonna uh, work. I mean, it's crazier than that. I had met a guy who's taking a lot of pictures. So you're always backstage and in these weird yeah. areas, like media areas. And this guy would always be taking pictures and I met him and he liked computers like I liked computers. And we started desktop publishing this. And we were using like the handheld Logitech scanners to scan uh -huh. the pictures in. Uh, we would go and deliver the magazine to the printer and it would be like a stack of disks, like floppy disks taller than you. Right. Like it was early days of all this stuff. And um, it worked. We wound up doing two magazines. Uh, supported a third, and I, at the time, and now we're moving to like 92-ish, like the internet started. Right. And I, you know, I saw the web browser, I, I just knew that this was where I needed to go. Mm. So I started publishing the magazine online. This is before hyperlinks existed. So each page had its own address. Like it was ridiculous, uh -huh. Long, there was no short URLs, I mean it was crazy. Right. Uh, in fact, in, in like 92, I had a cover on one of my magazines and it was called The Net. And the big innovation at the time was hyperlinks, the fact that you could link from one page to another, right? And um, you know, from there, I was really immersed in, in, in marketing, media, technology, advertising. Mm -hmm. That was sort of the crux. I did it for about two and a half years, three years, and I burned out. I mean, I was a young guy. We were running like three magazines. It was just you know, anxiety and stress. Mm -hmm. and I sort of came back to Montreal and thought, you know, I got to have someone else pay me to do this. So I like, became an editor of a, of a local sort of newspaper where they're trying to encourage people to stay and like grow businesses. So I wound up meeting a lot of entrepreneurs. But that's gotta be like, I mean, a little bizarre though. Like you're sort of, you go from <laughs> being the kid yeah. who's on the edge, who's pushing things, who's like in the new technology space, back to the world of newspapers? Well, it was, yeah, I mean, they were somewhat, it was community based and they were somewhat progressive because they were like, they had a big online thing and it was like a community thing. Right. And at the same time, they were cool. They were like letting me freelance and work out when I wanted to. So it was right. sort of like a bit of a carefree life. And I met these guys who were starting this search engine. And it was actually a meta search engine. So it was a search engine that was aggregating search results from other search engines. You gotta frame mm -hmm. the world. There was no Google. Mm -hmm. And so they were taking like Yahoo, Wait Lycos. There was, there was a time, time yeah, I call it pre-G. No yeah, exactly. PG, literally, pre-Google. And um, they brought me in and said, you know, I interviewed them for this article. It's like an interesting thing for me because the web was really happening. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, why don't you come and do sales for us? What is that? Like, what is sales? I and mean, I didn't even know what it was, but I took the job. To this day, I don't know why I took that job, but it was probably the best move I ever made in my life. Mm -hmm. I took this really interesting job selling online advertising before there was online advertising to sell. It wound up going through the whole dot com, I mean, explosion. All the way up and then. And all, all the way, way down. Yeah. Uh, but I rode the whole way. Like, I stayed there for about four years and I learned so much about all of those components technology, innovation, marketing, advertising, new right. ways of connecting. I, mean, I remember being on early calls with the guys from Google. I mean, they were trying to figure out how to even build monetization. Right. And I mean, literally remember speaking to Sergey and Larry, who were like, so why do you guys do this and how do you do that? And, you know, really interesting phone calls. And, um, from there, you got to frame the time. I went over to these two guys who were doing this mobile content. I mean, mobile content, there was no mobile web browser back then. Right. It was just like on decks of Verizon, it was like one was like news, two was like sports, three was like entertainment, and they were like entertainment. Right, and they, on a screen this big. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was uh, like a, yeah, the size of a, of, a, of a coin. In fact, right. one of the games we had was called Flip a Coin, where you would hit the button and it would basically like dot matrix, black and white spin, <laughs> would be either heads or tails. That was the game. It was making tons of money on like on, on all these carriers. I uh, did that for about a year, got fired. First time I was ever fired from a job. Uh, it wasn't a right fit. The guy who owns the company is still one of my closest friends. We joke about uh -huh. it all the time, but it just wasn't the right fit. From there, I did a small stint in a PR agency. Then I went back and started a record label that actually did really, really well eventually after I left, it did really, really well. And then I met my business partners at Twist Image and I got into digital marketing. <laughs> it's like a chaotic. So, if, right, talk about squiggle. This squiggly, is like, it was all over. This is more like spiraling yeah, yeah. and zigging and zagging madly all over the place. But so, what are the commonalities there? Like, what are the, what are the threads? Like, look, I mean, it's like you said, looking when you're in it moving oh, forward, it's crazy. impossible to connect the dots. But looking back, what are the threads that sort of like move through everything? Bleeding edge innovation hmm. with a focus on um, how are people going to care about this? Like our, people are going to care about this. There's, there, there is this feeling unequivocally that I knew the internet wasn't a fad. There is this feeling unequivocally that when I saw mobile and data connect and every carrier was saying, we don't care about data, we care about voice and churn. Mm -hmm. There was, in my brain, it was for sure people would be using these devices as remote controls for their lives. Um, in the music thing, it was, you would see this band and go, 
I don't know if they'll sell a lot, but it sounds like this could be the future. Hmm. And for sure, when it was Twist Image, it was a question of how do we create the agency that should be in marketing? Like, what would that agency look like? And so, for me, that's for sure the, but again, how do you know that when you're going through? You Man. don't. You're following your spirit, you know? You really are following that sort of thing that is like, where is this all going and how do I make that something that's interesting? Yeah, I mean, it's so funny because I, I know we both, we talk to entrepreneurs a lot and there's so many times where people come to me and they're like, should I keep doing this? Because everybody has the, not the classic hockey stick yeah. right in their mind and they're waiting, you know, to go from here to here and everyone has this sense that the people who have done that, they kind of knew it was coming. You know, and whereas we actually talked to most people where they, they were in a business and building, building, and it really started to hum and take off, and you know, the growth curve started to arc up strongly. A lot of times, like the day before that started to happen, you know, like they were still trying to figure out whether they should walk away or keep going. It still feels like I'm nothing. <laughs> it still feels like I'm, you know, I mean, you know, I go to the TED conference and yeah. it's like, no one knows why. You know, I'll go to the conference, no one knows. Like, it still feels like I haven't even done what I'd like to do, like I just feel like it's on, I'm on page one here. Mm. And, and I don't know if that's, uh, if that's the imposter syndrome kicking in. I don't know if it's the constant entrepreneurship. I don't know if it's the sort of critical, like I do a lot of self-critical thinking, which is I think why I blog and podcast yeah. a lot. So I like publishing how I'm feeling or, or where it's taking me. But there's for sure that, that strange component where I feel like I haven't done anything yet. So even like when someone does an intro for me, I'm sitting here like, who are they talking about? Like, who are they? Because in my brain, I'm just sort of, tr I'm still trying. Okay, so this is really fascinating, right? Because people look at you and say, okay, he's got it all figured out. You know, he's on top of a well-known, you know, well-known agency, he's a successful author, successful speaker, and other things. Um, do you have a sense for what you're building? I, I th it's a great question. I think practically I do. Like I know when a, a big client comes into our office, whether it's a Walmart or Warner Brother Games, like I, I sort of know what the project, the sort of beginning, middle, right. and end is. But I always move myself back and I look at what I'm building in terms of the, yeah, the, the more thinking lens, and right. the bigger lens. And the answer is I don't know if I know exactly what it is, but I sort of see where it's going. Mm. Do you know what I mean by yeah. that? Like I couldn't tell you it's going to be a search engine, like the guys at Google were like, we're gonna do, do a search engine. Uh, in fact, I would say like, well, what is Google now? And you can sort of look at it and go like, I don't know if Sergey and Larry could tell you what Google is. You could say it's gathering all the world's knowledge or whatever, but really what is it when you look at the, the sort of pieces, I think it's harder. But I think there is that sort of line that says, there is a better way for brands to connect to consumers, mm. and there's a better way for consumers to connect to brands and to one another, and I also don't know why there's this disparaging thought that there's something wrong about any form of commerciality. Mm. And so I'm really passionate about the fact that I love brands, you love brands, we all love brands. In fact, we love great stories. Why is that wrong? And so I'm constantly, I mean, I call myself a media hacker because mm. I'm like, I, I love that idea of like, like there's gotta be easier and funner ways to do this, you know, rather than let's take this product and put it on Facebook or Twitter and annoy people with it. Yeah. I'm like, there's gotta be a better way here. And so I'm constantly in that sort of white space of what's the better way? What's the better way to, to do something? The challenge is I'm convincing people of very traditional ways of thinking and doing and have, you know, um, dogma. Right. So to me, it's about like, how do you kill dogma? How do you make marketing, marketing is my passion, how do you make that something that people want to do? Who, who's ever woken up and said, I want to be a marketer? And we laugh at that, we really right, laugh, yeah. but to me, it's like, I don't know why. Like, why is it the default when you suck at your MBA or it's not working out of law school, you go into marketing? Like, why do people say, like, this is actually a really fun vocation? So I'm sort of like in that space where it's like, I want to, I want to sort of make it like fun and cool. Yeah, and it's fascinating to me because I've had this conversation a number of times where it's sort of like the question goes, um, can you live a good life if you don't have a very clear picture of exactly like what mm. that end point is that you're pursuing? Mm. And there are a lot of people that say, no, you can't. Like you need to be, you know, you need to know like this is exactly what I'm, what I'm building. This is the goal that I'm striving for. These are the steps to get there. And that's how I'm gonna apply my life, my energy, and that's how I, you know, I build my good life. And, and I just haven't found that to be the case with most people that I've been in conversation with, that I've, you know, in, in my own experience, it seems to be much more like what you're talking about, where you have this sense of, you know what matters to you, and an openness to, and you pursue 
opportunities to, to be fully expressed within the context of involving yourself in what matters deeply to you. And the way that may actually manifest right. in the world in terms of entities or accomplishments or achievements is myriad. There's, there's a maturation that happens in people, and I don't know when it happened in your life, and I'm not sure if I can actually say when it happened in mine, but I know it was somewhat recently. Mm -hmm. And it, it comes from a conversation that I talk about in the book, but I think it's such a powerful conversation, because it's the difference between the linear and the squiggle. Yeah. Um, I was having lunch with a friend of mine who's similar age to us, and she was saying how unfulfilled she was in life and how unsatisfied. I know you never have those conversations or people calling you to ask for, for your opinion on that, right? It's all the time. And, and look, you know, like, fair disclosure, I'm human too. I go there also. Well, for sure. Time. And you're like, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's chat it up. It's normal. So we were talking about it, and this is a person who did okay in math and sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, they were 16 or 17. They sat down with a guidance counselor, and they said, why don't you try engineering? person looked at it and went, yeah, it sounds pretty good. I'm good at math and sciences. Went through university, college, did okay. Got the job, got the mortgage, got the kids. Right. Moved along, middle management. Like you said, they're really sort of, you know, they're comfortable in the space. Not happy. And I sort of off the cuff said something like, um, isn't it amazing that like this random decision you made at 16 has this complete implications on your entire life and where you are? And like, if I tell you her jaw hit the floor, not as a visual, but like as a physical manifestation of like conk. Yeah. And at the same time, I think we both both had that, that epiphany, which is like, God, I don't want to see pictures of myself when I was 16, let alone base what I am as, as, a, as an older person with family on that decision. And when you ask that question or that thought, what it takes me back to is I never had that. Hmm. I was never 16 in the guidance counselor's office saying like, what should I, like give me direction. Nah. I was always tinkering hmm. and I was always hacking at things. And so whether it's the fact that my, I come from a lower middle class family and we're four boys and for the holidays instead of individual gifts, my parents would have bought, bought us like the Atari or the, or the Atari 800 right, computer, yeah. like whether that was a seed, whether it was the fact that I was, I was the kid who got kicked out of school for giving in a book report that was printed up on dot matrix printer because it should have been handwritten. Mm -hmm. Think about, you know, all these things that, that, that sort of formulated in my brain is sort of like, just go and explore and do things. And like, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay not to know. But yeah, there's a moment where you sort of hit and you're like, wow, thank God I didn't listen to a guidance counselor or just get stuck in the dogma of a traditional education or yeah. it's really interesting. Yeah, and I've been through a really similar process and I think yeah, and I was the tinkerer. Like I was constantly experimenting, and I was the lemonade stand kid. And <laughs> and I spent some time in Main Street, like employed by someone else, also like later in life. But uh, I really think it is. It's so interesting how those early things, where you just say yes to somebody else's, you know, like pronouncement about the path that you should take. It's fascinating how long people will stay along that path, even though. They, like if they tune into their gut, it's screaming no, 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 later in life, because you don't know early until you actually get the experience on your belt. And then, but instead of doing anything with it, you become so entrenched just in you know, that life that you've built that the thought of disrupting it in the name of potentially creating something deeper, more rewarding, more impactful to you and to the world is horrifying to so many people. And I think when you're doing it sort of little steps along the way and it sort of becomes mm. who you are, it's easier like being in the music yeah. industry, you know, now that I go on the road and I speak and I'll do 60 events a year, you're, you're away from your family, but, but, but sadder, you're by yourself. Right. So when I speak to my friends in the music industry and they're like, oh, like it's sort of, they'll go up for three, four months on the road. Yeah. And I'm like, how do you do that? Now they have camaraderie, they've got a band and they've got support. Right. When, it's, when it's on your, on, on, you're different. But I'm just wondering, like, was there a thing in your life where you were like, oh, there's like this sort of random thing that you only discovered later that had such a massive influence? Like for me it was, I used to love comic books and mm. I, I still do. And I, it never connected to me, this idea of like art and creativity and telling mm -hmm. stories and like how profound of an influence that was, whether I was sitting with my cousin on the floor or by myself in that store, exploring art yeah. and seeing how it connected to commerce and because they were collectibles. And I was like, wow, this, I never realized until I was like an older guy, I was like, wow, like phew, this little stupid thing in my life. And it was really impactful on me. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting for, I don't know if there was a moment, I, I remember I remember a moment where I actually became interested in understanding how stories are told. Um, and, I, and, I, and I also realized that I may have some facility at it myself. I mean, I was, little, I was dating my wife at the time, and I was an avid mountain biker, and she wasn't, and she didn't have a bike. And I was reading through a mountain biking magazine, and they had like, tell your story and win a bike. 
So I'm like, ah, whatever, I wrote a story, I sent it in, totally forgot about it. A couple months later, I get a thing saying, like, your story's been accepted, it'll be published in the magazine. And then, of course, my first thing is I call up the editor, I'm like, so basically you're saying nobody else submitted anything, right? Because <laughs> it could, you know, this, right. you know, it's a good Imposter story. Imposter syndrome. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'm not a writer, right. you know, I'm like, no, you know, just did this. Um, but I started thinking to myself, I'm like, I, when I, I remember writing that and thinking, how can I tell this story mm. in a way that really, like, really shows what happened, because it was an amazing story and draws people in. And I started to really, maybe start to awaken to this inner fascination with, with storytelling, which, and psychology and human nature and why people do what they do. Um, and so to me, like, I'm a marketer, I'm an entrepreneur and a, a media producer, but fundamentally, I'm just somebody who's obsessed with, with psychology. Why, why do people do what they do? And why don't they do what they do? And that's the common thread with everything for me. So that's really interesting, because for me, as a marketer, there's sort of a, a story, but then it's the human story, too. And so everyone will talk about this idea of storytelling as like mm -hmm. the thing. And I think that what you're actually saying is there's storytelling, but there's another component, which is systems. And yeah. that's the psychology, and that's the technology. And, that's, right. and I think that what we're missing a little bit in the world, for sure in the business world, is how those two come together. Yeah. And I'm really sort of been spending a lot of my time thinking about like, okay, there's a storytelling for sure, but now we have these amazing new systems right. that we can use to really bring them out. And so for me, that collision is really exciting. Which is the perfect segue to your book. <laughs> <laughs> if you so say so. Okay. Um, so you've got this new book out called Control, Alt, Delete. Um, which is kind of like a, a big rally cry to reboot the system. Focus, you know, like we said, business context, but it's really bigger than that. First, the name. Yeah. Talk to me about where that came from and what, and what it really signifies. I had heard this story about this guy, Cortez, who discovered Mexico. And you sort of read the word discovered and you're like, they didn't discover nothing, they conquered, right? There was like a massive, right. but there's this infamous story about this guy and how his crew and him and he was leading the charge were making their way inland. And a couple of his men were like, so like, what's the plan? When are we going home? What are we doing? And he burned the ships. Right. Only go forward, no going back. And it was one of those things that you hear in motivational speakers. I think like Anthony Robbins right. tells the story. And um, I put in the context of, of my life and, and business and I realized, wow, everything we're doing online, digital at the time, is just traditional put online. It's like copy paste. There's like no real, now that we've reinvented a system, how do we create new things on that system? And so I realized if I tell audiences to burn the ships, you're not gonna get them anywhere. So I sort of mild it down by saying, why don't you just control, alt, delete, and reboot? I thought it was funny and I thought it was sort of like the modernization of Cortez. And so when I published my first book, Six Pixels of Separation in 2009, it was, that was sort of the entry to the presentation, was this idea of control, alt, delete. And it just stuck with me, like it was sort of just there. And I sort of was talking to my, my literary agent, my publisher about the next book, and I think the title's this. But it really came to me, it, it's sort of the classic cheese ball creative thing. I was in the shower, and like it just was like <laughs> lightning. And like, I, I hate saying it because like you never want to be that guy, but the like, cliche is totally true. I need a pen that writes in the shower. I came out of the shower and I said to my wife, like uh, I gotta put this down on paper. And um, for me, it was about the co that collision again. It was this idea that I, I had been, over the years, I blog every day like 800 to 1,000 words. I write for the Harvard Business Review and Huffington Post and I'm speaking, you're sort of just collating all these things. Mm -hmm. And it sort of synthesized into these five movements. And when I looked at the five things, I was like, people might know about them or maybe not, but nobody's doing anything about them. Mm -hmm. So that was yeah. sort of that, so that was chunk one. Chunk two was, I looked at it after and I said, so the book is, that's a, that's a book, it's a meaty book. What do you do? And what do you do yeah. as a person who has to wake up the next day and go to work? And so it wound up actually working out well because I called the first part of the book Reboot Business and the right. second part of the book Reboot You. And now I'm sort of in a place where I'm like, it's not self-help because it's not really about, I mean, I, I guess there is a personal development component of it because you want to be better, but it really is about how do you bring yourself into this world because I don't believe in work-life balance. Mm. All right, there's so much that I need to deconstruct right there. <laughs> um, and I want to talk about the I've five. I've got all day for you, man. <laughs> <laughs> the marathon podcast. I want, to talk, I want to talk about the five, but, um, but that last sentence, um, I don't believe in work-life balance because I've had this conversation so many times and I don't either. Um, I don't, but yeah. deconstruct that. Sure. Explain that. Uh, life is a stool. And stools have three legs. And three legs are very simple. It's personal, it's family and friends, 
It's community. It's the people you surround yourself with and that, that are part of your infrastructure. Community I define as local, national, and international. Mm -hmm. And then there's the work that you do. If at any point one leg of that stool is a little off, the whole stool is going to topple over. You need to have that balance. And so this idea of like, it's nothing personal, it's just business. Not true. Mm. <laughs> How many hours do you spend working every day? I take it really personally. Right. I always tell people I have very thin skin. I don't have thick skin at all. I have very thin skin. Because I'm putting a lot of my heart and soul into what I do. I'm very happy. And I, I know I fall into like the one percentile of the world. I know that. But still, I'm dedicated to that. So I don't believe in work-life balance. And I was looking for a word and I had an amazing encounter with uh, Patrick Pichette, who is mm -hmm. the CFO of Google. And uh, I'm at this event and he's there and happened to be in Montreal where I live, and that's where Patrick is from. And some of his old Bell cohorts, Bell was where he used to work, were there. And one guy goes over to him and goes, so, uh, you know, what's it like working at Google? And like, uh, do you have any work-life balance? And, and Patrick looked at the guy, like, dead in the eyes, did not blink, and said, you don't take this job for work-life balance. <laughs> and I was like, that's the craziest thing I had ever heard any executive say to any other peer executive. So having drinks, I sit down at the tables, there are like two or three tables, and I sit down next to a friend, and he happens to sit right next to me. And I'm like, you know, I'm fascinated by what yeah. you said. I got it deconstructed. And he goes, you know, listen, he goes, work life balance. He goes, it's about blend. Mm. And so I, I stole his blend thing, I attributed it to him in the book, but it's this idea that, like, you know, you're going to London for this crazy meeting, like, bring the family along and spend an extra two days. Right. Um, you know, you're in New York City and you got a ton of work catch a play, go see a movie. Like, you gotta find the pockets where you can create blend. The reason I say blend is because most people don't blend, they intersect. So you'll see things like Elon Musk talking about how, you know, he's emailing while he's with his kids and this exploded on the web and became this whole thing like he's a bad parent and everything. And I was like, I don't know if he's a bad parent. I mean, he's got a lot on, this guy's got a lot on his plate. So I don't think any of us can really judge, but there is something about saying, I'm gonna play with my kids for this hour because I can do my email the hour that they go to sleep or whatever right. it might be. And I, I, looked, I took a step back and looked at that whole construct and was like, I have a very healthy blend because I've got the three legs of that stool and they are really balanced and I continue to, you know, it's like a gut check. You're sort of like, right. am I balanced? And I love the concept of blend and it's, it, it actually, it's really helpful to me because it helps inform sort of my approach also. Um, you know, when I travel, we, we usually take a big trip in the summer, anywhere from, you know, like a month to a month and a half with the family. Right. But, I, like, I can't easily take off that much work from everything, that, that much time. So what I do is I integrate, you know, yeah. there are times where, um, so it flows seamlessly. So we may be in Bali, we may be in Asia, we may be in Hong Kong, whatever it is. And there are times where we kind of move in and out of, okay, like, there's an understanding that I have to do a certain amount of work. But also, I think the bigger concept is that Work-life balance comes from a baseline assumption that um, work is it's not- outside of life. Right, yeah, it's that's outside of life. It doesn't feed it, it doesn't intersect. It's no. something that you need to stop doing because it You're only- You're not living life. <laughs> right, because it's something that exists purely so that you can feed life. Right. Rather than saying, no, I, I'm passionately drawn you know, like to, to what I do, to the people that I'm around, to the environments in, in which I exist. I wouldn't want to leave them behind. You had uh, Seth Godin on the show, yeah. and Seth is the greatest. I love him so much. And he, I don't know if he told me this story or if I read it somewhere. You know when you, you follow someone so closely, like you don't know now, if it's yeah. like, I, did you tweet about that? Or did I, and he tells this story about how he was like in Hawaii or something speaking I, at an event. It was a post, a couple, because I remember. Was it a post? Okay. Yeah, I, that post struck me so powerfully. So the idea of the post is he's sitting there typing. I guess he didn't want to sit in his room, so he's just sitting in the hotel lobby and he's doing his stuff. It's like late, late at night, like 11 o'clock at night, and this couple sort of strolls in like honeymooners or whatever. And, maybe semi-tipsy, who knows, and they sort of looked at Seth and were like, you know, like, look at this poor slob sitting here working. Right. And all he could say and think of in his brain was like, uh, it's so sad that you have to come all the way here once a year to enjoy your life, to sort right. of like have a vacation versus like my life, which is just, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And I've actually spoken about that to other people and they take high offense to that story. Like, mm. you're, no, you're still not getting it. Like, this is the problem of a workaholic. And I'm like, you know, if you don't have that stool and you don't know your balance, you're not constantly doing the gut check and all you're doing is focusing on your work to the detriment of your community, and your family, and your friends, I hear you. But otherwise, bugger off. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't agree. Yeah, and I think it's also, um, no, I, it's so, so funny you brought that up because I remember reading that. And it's funny, when I, when I actually uh, had the conversation with him for this project, 
I was trying to remember where I saw it too, and yeah. I was like searching, I couldn't <laughs> find it, but I remembered yeah. reading it so clearly yeah. because it struck me, because um, it, it's just, it was, it was me, you know, and I, I, you know, when everybody's asleep, you know, one person may make a choice to go and watch TV or read a book, right. you know, but my choice would be, I wanna go write. I wanna go build something, I wanna go produce something. So why is that any lesser of a choice? Simply because it's labeled under work. People get crazy when I say like, I like email. They're like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I like. I don't know about that. But. No, but I like. I like the interaction. I like hearing from people. I like connecting. I like. I really like. I do. I enjoy the process of discovery. Mm. And I don't. I've always struggled with the same things. Where I'm like, do you really want me to unplug for two weeks? Where all I'm really thinking about is why take me away from the things I really love? Mm. Like, you know, go away. Don't watch TV. Like, I get like certain media diets and things like that. But if you love it, why would you want to take it away? And I think it's problematic when you don't have that blend. Yeah. And I think it's problematic when work falls outside of life. Yeah, no, I think that's the baseline. Let's circle back to the five things. The five. <laughs> the five. <laughs> Do you want to know all five? I want to know all five, or at least let's touch on them. Yeah. Um, so this interesting hap thing hap has happened with, what, the first one is what I talk about direct relationships. And you sort of think like how important they are to have direct relationships in this world where we're all connected. And, I started thinking about like, so brands are having direct relationships because their, word, their, their competitors will have them. Yeah. But then I started really breaking it down and realizing that we live in so much saturation that what's actually happening is that the, real, the war for this direct relationship isn't even against the competitors, it's against our business partners. What I mean by that is, yeah. imagine I bought a pair of Beats by Dre headphones and I bought them at Target. Both brands, Target and Beats by Dre are saying like, like us on Facebook. You know, follow us on Facebook. Right. It's a lot. Like I bought a hundred and twenty dollar pair of headphones that make me look dorky. You know, like it's, it's a lot of it's a big commitment. And you start thinking about like who owns that direct relationship? Should it be Beats by Dre? Should it be Target? Target right. Should it be Facebook? Yeah. And what you realize if you sort of dig into that first trend, into that first movement, is that all three, all three should. And what it pushes back to is whoever you are in that food chain you need to work exceptionally hard to really build that direct relationship. So mm -hmm. there's that, I mean, I talk a lot about the Kickstarter and the fact that right. you can go direct and have these direct relationships now like you never could before. Um, second movement is something I call sex with data. And uh, the I, Which is such a great name. <laughs> I actually, I was so worried about that chapter title that I, I originally called it Safe Sex with Data because I thought my publisher would have an issue with it. Like it's like, and then I realized like, who am I kidding? And the idea there is that we have a lot of linear information that we collect email addresses and direct marketing and stuff like that. But then we have this other world of circular data, as I call it. Circular data is the stuff that consumers are willfully putting out there. Mm. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it might be. Right. What happens when those two intersect? Like, What do you know about a consumer and who they are and how you interact with them when you understand both you know, Mitch at twistimage.com is the same guy on Twitter or mm. Facebook and what he really likes. So it's about transcending demographics and psychographics into really understanding who they are and not just who they are, but how you connect with them. And so the big sort of foundational work in there is how do you not freak people out? Well, uh, right, because that's what <laughs> comes up always, you know. If right, and uh, what, the, the sort of assertion that I'm trying to make here is that when people are crying privacy, which is the big issue, and it is a massive issue, what I think they're confusing privacy with is personalization. And so I use Amazon as the benchmark for this. Like you buy an Amazon, I buy an Amazon. What does Amazon know about you? Everything. <laughs> they know more about you than your spouse does. I mean, you're feeling a little bit depressed. You might go on and look for a book on depression. You right. haven't even spoken. You know, they know everything. They know your credit card information, all that. They know everything. And yet we crave it more and more because they've created such a profound level of personalization for you. Mm -hmm that whatever information you're feeding into the system only adds to your personalization and better experience. So you're not willing to forego it. Right. Most brands mess that up. They're sort of capturing and doing bad things with data and they're not thinking about how do I create the better experience for you. And so for me, the movement is the fact that now you have these two worlds that have collided and you can do something with them and what does that mean? Um, the next movement is, is one of my most ex favorite. I call them movement, movements by the way because they've already happened. They're not trends or things like so that. So before we go on, yeah, also, sure. I mean, one of the things that popped into my head when we were talking, and we could spend the entire conversation on that. So I know I the five are big, it's like an that, audio right? bug. You know? We'll spend the whole thing deep. But on that one in particular, one of the things that popped into my mind was um, an earlier conversation that I've had with Charles Duhigg who wrote The Power of Habit. Great guy. And he told this big story that became a big piece in the Times about Target. Yeah, um, pregnancy. Forecasting, yeah. right, pregnancy. And, and, and how this freaked out the dad 
who didn't know that his daughter was right. pregnant when he saw a mailer with pregnancy stuff in the mail. So to me, that's a great example of the brand not understanding the co-relation between what the data is and what the personalization is, mm. and really understanding the consumer. And they had to disconnect. They didn't have sex with data. Right. They were, they were fooling around. They weren't in, in that component of it All yet. sorts of other analogies. Yeah, yeah. Makes, totally. Might well, that's not be appropriate for the show. It's the but. only thing that makes uh, data and analytics sexy. So you put the word sex. Right. Right. <laughs> it was a total marketing strategy. Right. Right. Yeah, so it's an interesting example. But anyway, let's. Yeah. So uh, other movement is uh, utilitarianism marketing. It's a mouthful, mm -hmm. but it's so powerful, which is think about the world. And like if you want to connect to somebody, you, as a brand, you had gatekeepers. It was the media. Mm. You can create anything like this in text, images, audio, and video and publish it to the world for free. Why are you just creating an ad or communications platform? Why not create something people use? And so, again, thinking about like why we have businesses and offices, it's foot traffic where people will come by. The new foot traffic is the home screen. Right. It's the home screen of your tablet. It's the home screen of your smartphone. And so how do you create something that would be there, and most brands will go like, oh, like you know, twenty-five percent of apps get downloaded and never used, right, yeah. uh, or get used once and never used again. And my, you know, my, my rebuttal to that is that's because those apps suck. Right. I mean, we use apps all the time that really add utility. And my favorite example of it is, uh, is there's an app called Sit or Squat, mm -hmm. and the way the app works is you turn it on, it knows where you physically are because of the GPS capabilities, right. and it tells you how close you are to a clean bathroom. And in this city of New York, it's a killer app, and it's, <laughs> and it's important. Important. <laughs> And it's based off a wiki platform, so you can comment, add, rate, uh, right. all this sort of stuff. And it's by Charmin, a toilet paper company. You know, they're not pimping coupons. Right. They're not saying, like, here's a game with two bears with little white things stuck on their butts and you can plop them up. They're actually giving you something that is, sits in my travel folder of my smartphone because it's so useful to me. Right. You can do, every, every business can create utility. Why are we just constantly you know, pimping coupons and stuff like that? Right. So to me, it's about shifting to utility. And I think um, so many brands also think, that the first question is how can we move product, which you know, is always the bottom line. Yeah. But fundamentally, it's like how do we create an experience that has extraordinary value? Yeah, and I think the I think that's great in terms of the product or service, but I think in the marketing of it, you can create the utility that even yeah. augments that, right. and that's the thing where it's like so few brands are doing it. Yeah. Um, next movement is is really thinking about media as passive or active. This is like the big thing where like TV, mm. it's like tweet, chat, friend. Like I don't know about you, it's like ten thirty at night. Close the lid on the MacBook Air. I just want to watch Charlie Rose. You know, right. I don't want to think about like right. tweeting or chatting. I just want to watch it, and we forget that like. What's wrong with being passive with your media? Mm. What's wrong with reading a book or reading a magazine article? Why do I have to have links in it and audio and video clips connected to it and all this embedded stuff that I can share? Like, I think we're forgetting that people are active with media or they're passive with media. And I think brands' biggest mistakes is they're actually creating media that's active or passive but not in the right sense. So an example would be Google Ads. They created an advertising platform that is now bigger than the entire US print media. Mm -hmm that is conducive to the user experience, that's contextual to what I'm searching for, that's performance-based. They actually reimagined media for that channel. I think that's a challenge really that, that, that Facebook and Twitter are now dealing with. Right. And so how do you, you know, that real chapter is focused on understanding where's your disconnect. And most people have a massive disconnect where they're putting passive advertising into the active channel. And they're right. like, why doesn't it? I guess Facebook doesn't work. Facebook works amazing. Don't blame Facebook. Right. It's like, you know, it's like, why can't social media cure cancer? It's like, listen, you know, it can't do everything you want it to do, but it can do a lot if you're smart about how you do it. Um, and then the last movement is what I call the one screen world, which I know is going to be provocative because we live in a world where people talk about three screens, you know, the web, TV, and mobile, four screen being a tablet. I say no. I say it's a one screen world. The only screen that matters is the screen that's in front of me. Screens are ubiquitous. They're cheap. They're all connected. And we live in a world where, while well, you might have a companion device, you're watching TV and you're on your iPad, you don't have your right eyeball on the iPad and your left iPad on, you know, on the TV. You are engaged in this screen or that screen, or this screen or that screen, or wherever the screen may be. And as the world evolves, and we're in a post-PC and post-web browser world right now, and the data proves it, it's gonna be more and more of this. So I, you know, my niece, who's 19, when she was 16, she'd come home from high school, she'd have her laptop, open it, turn on the TV, put on her earbuds with her iPhone, and she had a Blackberry. It's like she's running NORAD. You know, I was like, what did you do, you know? Now she right. comes home, she takes out her tablet, and that's it. All the stuff is there. It's a connected screen. It's mm -hmm. there. She can touch, she can be passive with it, active. I see it happening more and more, and I think that that's sort of where we're at. And we have to sort of just accept it versus like, what are we doing on the web? What are we doing on mobile? So the one screen world is just about thinking about how consumers interact with connected screens now and what that means for your business. And again, 
you know, we're, we're, we're sort of just grazing right, over because yeah, yeah. I, I go really deep in, in the book. But. So um, I guess the question is, what do we do about these five movements? How do we respond to them? How do we, how do we serve people uh, in a better way because of them? You reboot. You know, I mean, that, it, you know, the story of the book is that if you take, it, if someone said to me, you know, is it like a Chinese menu, like choose number two and number three? Right. I don't think you can. I think you need to be able to look at these movements and ask yourself fundamental questions about who you are when you come to work and how you're seeing things and how you're signing off for things or taking part in things. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately at a macro level, how is your business competing against competitors knowing that these movements have changed the world? Right. Like, so I don't know if it's as simple as, you know, I, I, the brazen thing is like, read the book if you want to be employable in the next five years. And so when I, you know, when okay. the publisher and I sort of worked on that idea, it became a bit of hyperbole and marketing chatter. But I don't know about you, I, I've been in business with Twist for about 13 years. I'm hiring for jobs that didn't exist when I started this agency in yeah. areas that didn't exist. Right. I mean, what probably not even 13 years ago, but a couple years ago. Yeah. What do you think the next five years are going to be like? Right. So yeah, it's pretty dramatic. Yeah, so I, I guess part of the big message is behind the concept of rebooting is also you know, this idea of the learning curve never stops. Yeah. You, know, you have to be a constant student for your entire life. Um, and I wonder how people feel about that. I think you know, like when I hear that, I'm like, sweet. Sweet. You know, that's awesome. That means that I never hit a point where I feel like I'm not learning anymore. What could be better? But I, I wonder if some people hear that and like, oh, damn. I go to my community library with my young children and I think I can't wait to retire and come here every day mm -hmm. and learn and look at books and all the topics I never thought of. If it's still, libraries are still around, then we'll, we'll see when we get there. And then I see the alternative, friends and family members who are actually at, of retirement age who sit on the couch and just basically rot away. And it's very tragic for me. I don't know why we have this stigma that, um, well, let me go back. I dropped out of university. I was never a good student. I, I was dragged through school kicking and screaming. But I'll tell you one thing, I never let school get in the way of a good education. You know? And um, I feel bad for people who don't have a desire to self-perform. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I'm the guy who, sure, I've been on stage with Tony Robbins and on the same bill as him, but I'm the guy who then goes into the audience and listens because I don't get our world. I don't get a world where people will go to the gym every single day to make their body finely tuned, but will spend zero time on anything that happens above the neck. Mm. So just as, as, as you might be you know, doing a whole bunch of miles in Central Park one day, I'm going to read a couple chapters of a book or do something else or, or write or think or create. Uh, it boggles my mind how we have turned education, self-education in particular, into this sort of thing that says, well, once I'm out of university, yeah, I, I'm good. No. I mean, why? Like, I mean, Warren Buffett, who I am not even close in terms of even thinking about investing, forget even on the same world as this guy. You just watch him and all he does is read all day and you're like, really? Yeah. It's like, how else do you think you're going to improve your perspective? I mean, I happen to think it's not the, the best and only thing. I think that why I love blogging and creating podcasts and, and writing is because that's the output of the thinking. So I, I think people also miss that. They're like, oh, blogging is hard. I'm like, it's not hard if you're critically thinking. It's not hard if you're actually like, spending the time to right. put what you've learned into words. It's and actually if, profound. And if you're seeking experience and knowledge. Yeah. And I think, yeah. so again, we, we talked about comic books earlier. I was big into the martial arts and the mixed martial arts and things like that for many, many years. And I think about back to what that is and it's that empty cup. It's that Zen mindset. Like you don't know what's going to happen in that room on any given day. And you got to go in there <clears throat> you know, with the full expectation that um, I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn something new. And it may, not, it may be really hard, that lesson, but I'm going to learn it. Yeah, very true. Um, so kind of coming full circle here. Um, this is the name of this project is Good Life Project. And uh, interesting in the context of this conversation and, and the idea of rebooting, the idea of, of tapping into these movements and basically saying, okay, things have to change and an evolutionary process and sort of this idea of life balance, all these things we've been talking about. When I offer the phrase to live a good life to you, what comes up? What does it say to you? This? Hmm. You know, it, it, I, I don't, people create constructs for the future that will always let them down. And you, I think that it's interesting because I'm sort of working on the third book and it has nothing to do with this topic that we're about to discuss, but it was going to be. 
I was walking with a friend of mine who had sold the company for over $100 million and then bought it back a year later for a dollar. So imagine the life that this person is leading. And all they could do is lament about how unsatisfied they were and how they could, they're struggling because they can't find the next project. And my sort of comment to them was, I can't believe that you're not enjoying the middle. Mm. This is the middle. So I, I sort of can look around and go, I'm sitting here with Jonathan Fields talking about the Good Life Project, a project that I love and I love what you do in New York City, one of the most magnificent cities in the world, in a career that I love with, with a loving family, good balance in, in my community. It would be selfish of me and it would, be, it would sort of negate all the things I've done to say like, so what would it mean next? And so I jokingly tell people that this was my exit strategy. Right, starting my own business, doing my own thing. That's the exit strategy. And that um, if this is Groundhog's Day, may not be such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful way to leave it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the conversation today. It's, you I, got it. I've, I've enjoyed it so much. So, um, I'm Jonathan Fields, and uh, my guest today has been Mitch Joel, signing off for Good Life Project. Mm -hmm.